Tibet is the highest region in the world. It is home to the Himalayas and Mount Everest. In 1951, Tibet became a part of the People's Republic of China. And by 1959, the Dalai Lama himself had to flee Tibet to the neighboring country of India, where he has lived ever since. For many Buddhists, Tibet is a very holy place. However, there might be more to Tibet and the Dalai Lama that meets the eye. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. Also, as always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons. Without you, this channel would not be possible. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on part four of our deep dive into Hollow Earth, we are going to be talking about the Dalai Lama. Now, if this is your first time joining us or you happen to miss parts one through three in this deep dive, they will be linked down in the description box below. I'm also going to be a guest on another channel tonight. That link will also be down in the description box below. We are going to be doing a deep dive again on Glam's Castle and Somerset Belenoff. So if that is really interesting to you, then please follow the channel listed down below so that you can take part in this discussion. This channel is really big into the occult, and so we'll probably go a little bit deeper than we do on this channel. And I'm super, super, super excited and I hope you guys will join us there tonight. Nicholas Rorick was born in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1874. He went on to become a very gifted and talented artist. In fact, in New York, there is a museum dedicated to the work of Nicholas Rorick. If you would like to visit that museum or get more information on it, that will also be down below in the description box. By the 1890s, spiritualism had exploded all over Europe. Mystery schools were popping up, people were engaging in seances, and starting to discover the religions of the East. By this point, Nicholas and his wife, Helena, became interested in Buddhism. After the Bolshevik Revolution of Russia, Nicholas and his wife left Russia. First, they came to the United States to start to show off Nicholas's paintings, but they did also end up in the East and really took to this Eastern philosophy that inner knowledge is more important than outer dogma, the inner realization. This is something we talk about with the Gnostic Gospels of Christianity. The inner knowing is the gnosis versus the outer knowing of edio or just intellectual knowledge. It is during this time that Nicholas discovered that he had a talent for channeling ascended masters, people who were more evolved spiritually than us mere mortals on earth. Through this, Nicholas discovered this idea of Shambhala. Shambhala being both a spiritual place and a physical place. Spiritually, Shambhala is about inner realization, inner contentment. Physically, if you can remember from our past episodes, Shambhala is the capital city of Agartha. Agartha being the kingdom inside of our earth. According to Buddhist theology, Agartha is filled with people who are way more advanced than we are. They are like ascended masters, but they live inside of the earth. Well, Nicholas Rourke revealed a secret that maybe not a lot of people at that time had known. That the Dalai Lama wasn't just a spiritual master for this certain form of Buddhism, but he was the terrestrial representation of the leader of Agartha. And not only that, but there were special caverns and tunnels that led into Patola Castle in Tibet, specifically 
to the Dalai Lama. And even to this day, high lamas still protect the entrance to the cavern to the kingdom of Agartha. This whole Great Awakening has taught us that sometimes people are not as they seem. A lot of our world has been run by fraudulent, evil, evil people that are a part of a special club that the rest of us are not invited to. And for a long time, I think a lot of us thought that the Dalai Lama was just a very old, kind man. But it turns out the Dalai Lama is also a part of this secret club. A club that we now know as the Cabal, or the Deep State. We now understand that the Dalai Lama is funded by the And when the Dalai Lama was living in Tibet, he ruled his nation under a theological dictatorship that involved serfdom. This meant that 98% of the Tibetan population lived under enforced slavery. In fact, under the Dalai Lama's rule, 98% of the population was illiterate and the life expectancy for a really long time was only 35 years old. Meanwhile, the Dalai Lama lived in a gorgeous palace of Patala and had his life taken care of. The Dalai Lama is supposed to be the reincarnate of the Bodhisattva of compassion. This means that he is supposed to be a soul who has already moved on and qualifies to be in a state of nirvana, but decides to unselfishly come back to earth time and time again to help us mere mortals move away from our own suffering and discover inner knowledge or enlightenment. Now the role of the Dalai Lama has been going on for about 300 years. We are on our 14th Dalai Lama. But to understand Patala Castle and the Dalai Lama's role in Agartha, we have to go back even further. The Patala Palace we see today was built by the fifth Dalai Lama on the advice of some of his spiritual leaders. Now this was around the year 1649, but the reason why the Patala Palace was built where it was built is because it was built on top of a fortress and a castle that had already been built by the 33rd Tibetan king in the 7th century. This 33rd Tibetan king was a man named Songsten Gempo. Now the fortress and the castle that he originally built in this place had 999 rooms. If you know anything about anything going on in this Great Awakening, as my friend, our friend Tom Numbers from Psych Club has taught us, numbers are important. We know that 33 is both a good number and a bad number. Again, as I said in the previous video, Jesus Christ himself was 33 when he was crucified and when you get to the 33rd degree of master masonry, you're really into some dark stuff. We also know that 999 is a very significant number as well. And while this fortress and castle was being built in the 7th century, the Tibetan king Songsten Gampo actually lived in some of the caverns and the caves that are underneath Patala Castle to this day. Are these the same caverns and caves under the castle that bring you to Agartha? I don't know. But the thing is, nothing is really coincidence anymore. Now, Songsten Gampo was the Tibetan king who turned Tibet into an empire. He joined the country together, and he did this specifically under Buddhism. He made Buddhism the official religion of Tibet. Again, this is really significant to Agartha because in the Buddhist faith, they do believe that the kingdom of Agartha is underneath our earth. Now, when the fifth Dalai Lama came around in 1649 to rebuild a new castle on top of the old one, they named it Patala Castle after the southernmost tip of India. 
Now, India, Patala means the underworld. And if you remember from a previous episode, the Indian people believed that the Nags lived in Agartha, that they were serpent-like beings or reptilian-like beings that were far more advanced than humanity and had a plan to destroy humanity, including abducting us, us humans, torturing us, and eating us from time to time. Now, because Tibet is the highest place on the earth, this area is called the roof of the earth. I find this odd because of the tunnels that go down to Agartha. Is it the roof of our earth or is it actually the roof of the underworld? Where the nags live, the serpent reptilians live, who have their terrestrial representation on our planet through the Dalai Lama. Now, not only is the Dalai Lama allegedly the terrestrial representation of the people of Agartha, but he takes orders from the leader of Agartha. Now, we've heard from many accounts that there are possibly many different species living in Agartha. We've heard about the Nordic people and the giants and the reptilians. So could it be that they are both good and bad entities on Agartha? Sure, why not? They're good and bad humans living on our planet as well. Now, we know, or at least those on this channel and other channels like this channel, understand that there's a lot more to the spiritual practices of the dark cult or the cabal than meets the eye. We know that they understand about reincarnation and they know how to transfer souls. If this is something that is new to you, I'm not going to go into that in detail during this story. There are plenty of other people that go into detail about this. Um, Tarot by Janine, our friend Tarot by Janine, she's read on this a lot. So if that's something you have questions about, you can hop over to her channel or any of my peers in this truther community that might have done some deep dives on to that practice of the cabal. We also know that these families within this cabal have a different education than the rest of us get. We get a fake education. Most of what we've been taught we now know is completely wrong and made up to control a narrative, to keep us dumbed down while they continue to know the truth and worship Lucifer, Yeldabaoth, the serpent, all the dots start to connect, right? So if we know that the dark arts, the dark cult, understand the process of reincarnation and have been able to kind of steer it throughout the ages with their own souls, then we have to look at this idea of reincarnation of the Bodhisattva with the Dalai Lama. And is the same thing happening with the Dalai Lama that has happened with, say, the royal families? The word Dalai Lama means an ocean of wisdom, just like the Illuminati get their name from to illuminate or to enlighten, to turn the light on, to know things, right? To not be in the dark. So ocean of wisdom for the Dalai Lama kind of, in my opinion, goes hand in hand. This Dalai Lama was born on July 6th of 1935. He was one of five children born to a peasant family. He was discovered by the High Lamas when he was only two years old. After the 13th Dalai Lama had passed away, it is the High Lama's job to go searching for the next Dalai Lama to see where the soul decided to reincarnate again. According to the Buddhist faith, this is the same soul living over and over and over again. Again, it comes back to that Bodhisattva of compassion that this enlightened being has very unselfishly decided to keep coming back in order to help humanity along, which now I think is a bunch of BS. Now the High Lamas look for a male child born shortly after the death of the recent Dalai Lama. And since the 14th Dalai Lama, the one we got now, was found at two years old, it did not take them long to find him. The legends go that the High Lamas know who he is by visions and dreams that they have, or if the previous Dalai Lama was cremated, they watch where the ashes blow, what directions the ashes blow, and that's the direction they 
go to find the next Dalai Lama. There also is a very special lake in Tibet that they can go to where they can see visions of where the next Dalai Lama might be. When they think they've found the new Dalai Lama, they bring with them a bunch of items that belong to the previous Dalai Lama, mixed in with some other just random stuff. And they show the little boy all this stuff, and it's a little boy's responsibility to then pick out the things that belonged to the previous Dalai Lama. That's how they know that the new child is the new Dalai Lama. So the current Dalai Lama was discovered at two years old, and by 1939, at the ripe old age of four years old, he was placed on the throne at Patala Castle. By six, he was ordained as a monk, and by 1950, he took full political power of Tibet. Let me say that again political power. The Dalai Lama isn't just the spiritual leader of Tibet, but he controls the government as well. In fact, in my humble opinion, the Dalai Lama is sounding more and more and more like the Pope. And we also know the Pope is dirty, dirty, dirty. By the time this 14th Dalai Lama took the political position of Tibet in 1950 was also around the time that China started to breathe down the neck of Tibet. The People's Republic of China was slowly starting to infringe its way into the Tibetan territory. Now we know that the CCP is no good. Despite what young people are taught nowadays, Communism is never a good thing. But in this situation, from all the research I've done, it looks like, ironically, that the People's Republic of China was the lesser of two evils. It was like treating one dictatorship in Tibet for another one. By 1959, the Dalai Lama was allowed into India to seek asylum as China officially took over Tibet. In 1989, the Dalai Lama was the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. However, nowadays, if you're awake and paying attention, the Nobel Peace Prize is not that big of a deal. The Nobel Peace Prize is basically the cabal giving each other awards and co congratulating themselves on shitty things done to the people. Kind of like the Oscars. In 1994, the UN officially took over the palace. We also now know the UN is nothing but evil as well and is part of the plan of the New World Order. In my opinion, Patala Castle is important to the Cabal because of its alleged connections to the underworld, to Agartha, to the serpent people. We know that the elites worship Lucifer. We know that the imagery of serpents are all over the Bible. The serpent was the entity that caused Eve to fall in the beginning. It is my opinion that China wanted to bet for the palace of Patala for the connection to Agartha. And it is also my opinion that the UN took over the palace for that very same reason. Now you can still visit the palace, but obviously these caverns are blocked off. One of the blessings of the Great Awakening, in my opinion, is now we have been reassured that we absolutely cannot take anybody else's word for it. We should not be following religious leaders, regardless of whether they're Buddhist or Catholic or Hindu or Islam or whatever the case may be, because truly the relationship with God lies within. And sometimes we can misdirect our intentions to the wrong person. Therefore, everything should be a personal relationship with the divine for yourself. We know that the cabal is very talented at manipulation, or at least they have been. The word apocalypse means to lift the veil, and in my opinion, that's what's happening right now. We are walking into or going through the apocalypse where the veil is being lifted, and we're seeing things exactly as they are. And as I heard Sean Stone say once, once you see the trick, they can't trick you anymore. 
Now, during this research, I was very saddened by the reality that the Dalai Lama himself is not a good person, that the Dalai Lama is part of the dark forces. That does not mean that the religion of Buddhism itself, or the philosophy, rather, of B Buddhism itself is bad. Just like just because the Pope himself is a doesn't mean that Christianity is bad. Just because Joel Olstein is part of the cabal doesn't mean that the Protestant version of Christianity is bad. It just means that we have misdirected our energies towards bad people and now we have a chance to course correct. We also know that the Dalai Lama is very appealing to the intellectuals of the world, the people that spend a lot of money on their education getting multiple, multiple, multiple degrees. We also know that to get your doctorate is another word of an indoctrination. We are learning now in the Great Awakening that the people that are supposed to be the smartest among us are actually the most brainwashed that most of our educational institutions are monitored by the Federal Reserve, so therefore they are taught to teach a controlled narrative. They are taught to tell people what to think instead of how to think. And so the principle of discernment is completely gone. The ability to critically think for some of these intellectuals is completely gone. And so it's not surprising to me that these people with a lot of degrees will spend $400 to go hear a dictator like the Dalai Lama speak. If you're still unsure about the Dalai Lama and where he sits in this battle between good and evil, a few years back, the Dalai Lama was paid $1 million by the cult Nexium with its leader, Keith Raniere. The Dalai Lama was paid this money to promote the cult. In the recent past, Keith Raniere and the cult Nexium has gone down for child And because of all the very, very big political people that were involved in Nexium, you better believe the Dalai Lama knew exactly what was going on in that cult. Now, once again, I think that the Buddhist faith is actually a beautiful faith. It's more of a philosophy in my opinion. In my opinion, you can take the Buddhist philosophy and incorporate it into something like Christianity. It's all about self-realization, which is something that Jesus spoke about as well. It's about being compassionate and loving towards your fellow man and discovering your own, your own relationship with the divine. That is not what's wrong. What's wrong is the Dalai Lama. And as we move forward into a new age, a new thousand years of peace, the age of Aquarius, where all the evil will be eradicated from our earth, I hope that us human beings remember not to worship false idols, that people are just people. They're good and they're bad. Some are more bad than others and some are more good than others but at the end of the day your relationship with god with the divine is between you and the divine no pope no priest no dalai lama no monk nothing no rabbi can stand in between you in that divine spark of consciousness that was given to you by god Next week for part five, we are going to do a deep dive into another sinister group associated with the Cabal who also has deep ties to Agartha. But for now, leave me your opinions regarding the Dalai Lama down in the comments section below. In the description box, you will find a couple of articles I found regarding the Dalai Lama and the CIA and the Dalai Lama and Nexium. Don't forget to join me tonight at 7.30. Link down in the description box below so you can join us on our deep dive on Glam's Castle and Somerset Belanoff. Thank you again to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. And as always, thank you so much to Todd Broderick for helping me get this video out to you guys today. I hope you're having a wonderful Friday and that you have a wonderful weekend ahead. I will talk to you soon. Bye.